In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we put ourselves in your presence right now. You say that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. Lord, plus we know that you're here really truly present in the Holy Eucharist, in the tabernacle, Lord. And so we pray the prayer that you've taught us, the most powerful prayer in the church, and uh, one of the most powerful deliverance prayers that we have. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Today we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. We're going to talk about what the Catholic Church or a Catholic perspective on spiritual warfare. I think you'll find tonight's talk very helpful and very interesting. This Pope, the one we have right now, Pope Francis, <clears throat> every single day I go on the Vatican website to see what he's saying. This Pope has talked more about the, de the devil and the reality of the devil than the last three Popes combined. This Pope, I'm going to say it again, has, has talked more about the reality of Satan than the last three Popes combined by far. In fact, this Pope doesn't go one week without giving a teaching on the devil. And so, as in honor of this Pope, the fact that he's trying to wake us Catholics up to the reality of the devil and reality of evil, this Bible study is in, in honor of Pope Francis, who inspires me to do this presentation tonight. You have my notes there. Take a look at uh, part one. First of all, Every one of us is a soldier of God. Guess where that's found in the Bible? What verse? It's right there in the notes. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. So young people, repeat after me. Say this. I am a soldier of God. Now point at your chest. Young people, say, I am a soldier of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 3, okay? That's what you are. Life is battle. So, <clears throat> we're going to talk tonight about not only the reality of Satan, the devil, we're also going to talk about what the devil fears. There's a prayer, it's called the St. Michael the Archangel Prayer. How many of you know the St. Michael the Archangel Prayer by heart? Raise your hand. Okay. I'm not sure if it's in the back of the mistlet. It's a beautiful prayer that was given to us it was given to us by, well, no, it's right in my notes. There, it's in the second paragraph. It's the notes. Uh, that prayer was given to us in 1886 by Pope Leo XIII. And St. Michael, the church calls him, the Eastern Catholics call St. Michael, this archangel, they call him the highest general in heaven. And Western Catholics, they call Saint, we call St. Michael the prince of the heavenly host, which means the prince of the heavenly army. St. Michael this archangel that we're going to invoke right now in a prayer, the devil's afraid of St. Michael because he's been given power and authority to defeat Satan. St. Michael did it once and he can do it again. In fact, the story of St. Michael defeating Satan that, happens, that happened in, uh, in heaven eons ago, it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 9, the last book of the Bible. Here's what it says. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon is a reference to the devil. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a lot of people say, well, I don't really worry about the devil because he's in hell. No, he's not. No, he's not. Read the Bible. He's on earth. 
The devil took a third, a third of the demons with him. The, a third of the angels rebelled, and they followed Satan in the rebellion in this war that went on in heaven. Two thirds of the angels, they stood with Saint Michael. So two out of three angels stood with Saint Michael and stood with God. One third of the angels made what the church calls an irrevocable decision to rebel against God and to engage in this war, and they were ultimately cast out by St. Michael and the good angels. Let's pray the St. Michael the Archangel prayer as we start this Bible study and this, uh, this teaching tonight. It's right there in your notes. Let's pray it all together. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All together, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's actually a minor exorcism prayer. It's a minor exorcism prayer. As Catholics, you should be praying that prayer every morning before you go to school and in, in the evening before you go to bed. And even throughout the day, when, you're, when, you're, when you feel the presence of something evil or some dangerous situation. When I was a cop in L.A., I used to pray that prayer all the time. In fact, that prayer, the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, I had it laminated in a card, and I had it in my breast, in my, in my bulletproof vest. In my bulletproof vest, there's a, there's a pocket there, and I just slipped my card in there. And I had my St. Michael the Archangel prayer card in my bulletproof vest. It was funny, one day one cop, he saw me taking off my vest and taking out my card, and he goes, what do you got there, Jess? I said, oh, St. Michael, he's a, he's a patron saint of policemen, and uh, he's a warrior angel that, that God has assigned to protect and defend us. He goes, wow, I'm a Catholic too, that's cool. Can I have one? So I ended up going to a Catholic bookstore, I ended up buying about 200 cards, and every cop in the station said, hey, I, I want to put one of those St. Michael prayer cards in my vest. And so, I don't know if they did it superstitiously, but I pray every day. I prayed it every day. And I prayed it oftentimes just when I was in dangerous situations. Let's go now to another, what's called the sacramental. What you see around my chest is crucifix. This is called a St. Benedict's crucifix. Okay? It's in your notes there. I give a little history of it. St. Benedict, he lived in the 5th century, and he founded monasteries all across Europe, as fortresses of prayer. The St. Benedict cross originates from the episodes of his life in which he fought against demons and evil influences. He was one of the first exorcists in history. He used to drive out demons and perform miracles with the sign of the cross. This medal in the back, it has a prayer of exorcism against Satan and a prayer for strength in time of temptation. This medal is a daily reminder that we must pick up our own cross and follow Jesus Christ our Lord and King. By the way, the word exorcism, it's a Greek word which means to drive out evil spirits. That's what the word exorcism means. The word exorcism in Greek, ex means out of, and horgizain in Greek means to swear by oath. So the word exorcism means to swear out demons by an oath. In the back of this medal, I generally wear it when I, when I go somewhere, when I leave the house, I have this medal hanging by my bed. I have one in my car, one by my computer. It's, the church says that anybody who, wear, who wears this medal and lives in a state of grace and, uh, and uh, lives in obedience to, to the teachings of the church, anybody who wears this medal that's been blessed by a Catholic priest, a demon cannot be in the presence of anybody who wears this medal. A demon cannot be in the presence of whoever wears this medal. A lot of times... People have come up to me, and I can, I can tell that there's some type of, they're under some type of demonic influence or demonic contamination, because what I'll do, they'll ask me, Jess, I'm hearing voices, and I'm having nightmares, and I'll say, okay, I'll take off my medal. I said, can you hold this? Sometimes they can't hold it. They said, no, I can't. Get it away from me. I said, okay, you need to go to confession. We need to talk. I said, there's something going on with you. But if you could hold this medal, if you could put it up against your, your forehead, like somebody came up to me the other day, Jess, Jess, I'm possessed by a demon. I said, are you sure? He goes, I'm sure, I'm sure, help me, help me. So I went to go meet the guy at the church. I met him at the rectory. I took off my medal. I said, I don't think you are, but let's talk. 
okay, what's been going on with you? He started talking to me. I took off my medal, I put it in his forehead, and I prayed. I said, how does it feel? He goes, I don't feel anything. I said, you're not possessed. A person who's possessed cannot, cannot be in the presence of this metal. If you put this on the head of somebody who's possessed, uh, they, will, they have a, what's called an aversion to sacred objects. So, uh, this metal here, on the back, it has an exorcism prayer in Latin. I have it in your notes. Take a look at your notes. Here's what it says in Latin. Okay? It's an exorcism prayer that says, Crux sancti patris benedicti, crux sancta sit mihi lux, non dracus sit mihi lux, bade retor satana, non suade mihi vana sut malaque libas, ipse venena vivas, e jus in obito nostro, presentia munia mur, gloria patri, et filii, espiritu sancto sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum, amen. In English, it means the cross of the Holy Father Benedict, may the Holy Cross be my light, may the dragon be not my leader, be gone Satan. Entice me not with deceits. What you offered is evil. Drink your poison yourself. Be here there to protect us at the hour of death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. How many of you watched uh, the movie uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose? Okay, some of you. There are three languages that the devil's afraid of. And it's in the Bible. It's in Matthew chapter 27. The devil is afraid of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Specifically, those are what are called the three sacred languages. Why? Because when our blessed Lord was hung on the cross, you see that, you see that sign that the Roman executioners posted over his head. The Bible says that the sign that they posted over his head said, uh, this, is, this is the king of the Jews. The Bible says it was posted in Hebrew, so the Jews could read it. It was posted in Greek, so anybody in the Middle East can read it, since Greek was the, the, the language uh, of the Middle East at the time of Christ. And then Latin was the time of the Roman, the Lat, Lat, Latin, excuse me, was the language of the Roman Empire. So those three languages are known as sacred languages, Hebrew, Greek, and, and, and Latin. The church uses still a lot of Latin today. Why is Latin so powerful? I'll tell you why it's so powerful. There's 195 countries in the world, thereabouts, 195, some say 198. Every, every language on planet Earth has been corrupted by the devil. What do I mean by that? There's bad music in every language. Is, is, let me ask a question. Is there bad music in English? Nasty, filthy? Is there? Uh, yeah, I think so. Is there bad, filthy, nasty, immoral music in Spanish? Okay. Every country in the world has been corrupted with filthy music, pornography in every language, uh, filthy jokes, vulgar jokes, obscenities, cuss words in every language, except Latin. Memo Catholics. Why? Why not Latin? Why has Latin been preserved from the corruption of the world and the corruption of Satan? Because Latin is no longer spoken in any country. Latin stopped being spoken in the Roman Empire right around 476 AD when the barbarians came from northern Europe and they came into Rome and they decimated Rome. Rome spoke Latin. When Rome was conquered by the barbarians in 476 AD, not only was the land conquered, but the language of Latin, it fell into disuse. No other country picked it up, so Latin is a dead language. It's not spoken anywhere on planet Earth. Therefore, Hollywood and Chris Rock and, uh, and MTV and HBO, nobody's made a filthy movie or filthy jokes or pornography in Latin because nobody speaks Latin anymore. It's a dead language. That's why the church uses Latin in her prayers and in her teachings. It's a very powerful language. It's the only language that's never been corrupted. Okay, who is the devil? According to the Jews, Jewish rabbinical tradition, that's the Jewish rabbis, teachers, they assert that the devil was the most important spirit standing by God's throne. 
The devil had 12 wings, twice as many as the seraphim, and the beginning of Satan's fall was due to envy and pride, according to the Bible, Wisdom chapter 2, verse 24, if you want to look it up. The devil desired to become greater than, than, than an angelic creature. He wanted to become independent of God. In short, he coveted the place rightfully belonging to God. According to the tradition of the church, when, uh, when the devil was given uh, a view of salvation history, and he saw that God's Son would become incarnate and become a, take upon a human body, Lucifer said, non servium, which means I'm not going to serve the God-man. If God takes upon a human body, I will not serve him. A lot of people, the Pope just made a statement yesterday, it's all over the news, he says, uh, the devil truly really exists. The devil's not a myth. That's exactly what the devil wants us to believe. In fact, there's a great author by the name of C.S. Lewis. He wrote a book called Screwtape Letters. And in chapter 7 of Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis, he, he has a, there's a conversation between a senior demon in hell called Screwtape, and he's having a conversation with a junior demon in hell. And he basically, the senior demon tells the junior demon, he says that the most effective thing you can do against humans is to convince people that Satan, our father, their father, doesn't exist. And so that's the strategy of demons. Because we can't see them, they want to make you believe that they don't exist. I think about... Demons are a lot more dangerous than anything out there. I remember years ago, I'm dating myself, who watched that movie, that 1984 movie called The Terminator? I'm sure some of you have watched this. You young people, okay? It's one of the Terminator. It's one of the classics. It's one of the early. It, that movie was made before most of you were born, okay? But I'm dating myself. I watched that movie several times, and you know this was uh, uh, this cyborg, this robot and stuff. You know the cyborg made of metal surrounded by tissue. And I remember there was this one part in the movie, which when I watched it, I said, "This is exactly who the devil is, but even worse." Kyle Reese, one of the actors in the movie, he's arrested by the police and he's trying to tell the police department about the dangers of this Terminator and that this, this Terminator is trying to kill Sarah Connor. And this is what Kyle Reese tells the police about the Terminator. He says, he told the police, you still don't get it, do you? He'll find her. That's what he does. That's all he does. You can't stop him. He'll wade through you, reach down her throat, and pull her blank heart out. Listen and understand. That Terminator is out there. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. That description of this Terminator, this machine, this cyborg with uh, human tissue around metal, that's a perfect description of the devil. The devil is a spiritual serial killer. He doesn't take any days off. He doesn't work eight hours a day. He never stops working. He doesn't take vacation time off. He doesn't take naps. He doesn't go to sleep at night. In fact, look what the Bible says about Satan in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It's in your notes. Let's take a look at this Bible verse. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. That's the first pope of the Catholic Church. He writes this. He says, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The word of the Lord. Now, I don't know if you recall, but back in the time of St. Peter, lions were very feared. You know why? Because Catholic Christians, every Saturday night, they were paraded, they were arrested. Catholics were paraded and arrested. And they were taken into the Roman Colosseum and they were fed to lions. The Roman Colosseum held about 80,000 people. So the theater on Saturdays in Rome, in pagan Rome, people would go and say, okay, hey, today Christians are going to be eaten by lions. Let's go to the theater. So they take their wife and their kids and popcorn and sodas. No, no popcorn and sodas back then. And they would fill up the Roman Colosseum and they would watch Christians being eaten by lions. That was the entertainment in pagan Rome for about 300 years. 
That's how people were entertained. Food, and on Saturdays, let's all go like a family and hold hands and watch Catholic Christians being eaten by the lions. Of course, you could be spared of being eaten by a lion if you would renounce your faith in Jesus Christ. You were given the opportunity. They would take, you, they would take the Catholics out into the middle of the pit naked, and you would have the opportunity. They would, the, the emperor would ask you, those who reject Jesus Christ, raise your hand. And verbally, you have to reject them. Say, I reject Jesus in the Catholic Church. If you do so, you're spared. You go back to your cell, put your clothes on, and you're free. Those of you that don't reject Jesus in the Catholic Church, we're going to unload the lions on you right now. Notice that Bible verse. I want to point something out on that Bible verse, 1 Peter 5, 8, especially for you young people. Because St. Peter tells us two, two words that we need so that we could defend ourselves against an evil spirit, the devil and his, and his minions. What are the two words that he says? Look at the first four words. Be sober, be watchful. Stop right there. How do you protect yourself against the devil? Number one, sobriety. If you're intoxicated, you're powerless against an evil spirit. If you're intoxicated, you're absolutely powerless against an evil spirit. Second thing, look what St. Peter says, be watchful. Be watchful, that word means in Greek, it means to be alert or be vigilant. It's a military term. In other words, St. Peter is talking to us like we're soldiers in a battle. We have to be alert, be watchful of our surroundings, of who we hang out with, of what we're watching, of what we allow to come into our senses. In other words, th this is, these are military orders. Be sober and be watchful. Okay, let's move, continue moving right along. Who can fall prey to the devil? There's... Four ways you can fall prey to the devil. Demons come to you either by attraction or invitation. What do I mean by that? Demons are attracted to evil people. I'll explain that more later. Demons are attracted to evil people. Secondly, demons need an invitation to come into a person's life, to contaminate a person. And so a lot of people... They do invite demons, and I'll tell you how that happens. There's always a point of entry. Anytime somebody has some type of demonic contamination, there's always a point of entry. They came in through what's called a portal, a door. They came into a person through a portal. Take a look at the notes there. There are four principal causes as to how people fall prey to the devil. In the first two instances that I'm going to mention, the person's not culpable. The last two instances that I'm going to mention, the person is culpable. Okay, number one. Sometimes demons attack and contaminate a person simply by pure divine permission. It's not the person's fault. In other words, God allows it. Nothing happens Nothing happens without divine permission. Even a demon who attacks a person or tempts a person or influences a person, a demon has to receive divine permission. But God never wills evil. God never wills suffering or temptation. God gives us the freedom, but He allows also the existence of evil. Our free will, but there's also the existence of evil, but God gives us grace, His strength, so that we can resist evil. And the Lord can even take a bad situation and He can make it good if we cooperate with Him. When the Lord gives a demon permission to torment us, He does so to strengthen us in virtue. In other words, God wants us to become holy. He wants us to reach moral excellence. And so God will allow a demon to torment us so that we can grow in virtue. If you want to see an example of that, when you get home, read Job chapter 1. It's right in your Bible. Job was one of the holiest men of the Old Testament. And Satan comes up to God's throne and asks him. He says, Lord, see your servant Job? And the Lord says, yeah. 
He's a good, holy man. He's a good son of mine. He goes, well, he's only good and holy because you give him everything. But if you let me tempt him, he'll turn away from you. So Satan had to ask permission. So God says, you can tempt him, but you can't hurt him. You can't kill him. You can tempt him. And so he did. So even the, the temptation that a demon will render to a person, they have to seek divine permission from God. They can't operate on their own. But God allows that temptation so that we can grow holy, we can grow in virtue, and, and we can grow in our faith and in our prayer life. Second reason why people fall prey to the devil, it's in your notes, subjection to a curse. That's not the person's fault. And that's generally the point of entry, subjection to a curse. In this instance, the victim is also innocent, but there is, there's culpability on the part of the person who cast the curse. A curse is a verbal intention of harming others through demonic intervention. And this is very common in the Latino community and in the Filipino community. Very common. And this can be achieved in many ways through a spell, a binding, an evil eye, a malediction, a hex, some type of incantation and so on. I've had several people that have told me, I've had several bad people that have told me, I've put a curse on you. And I laugh. You know why? Because if you live in a state of grace, it doesn't affect you at all. If you live in a state of grace, you have nothing to fear from a demon or somebody trying to put a curse on you. Remember how demons attack people or, or, or come into a person's life? It's called the law of attraction and the law of invitation. Demons are attracted to evil people. I'm not evil. I'm a man of faith. So I'm definitely not attractive to a demon. Secondly, the law of invitation. You have to invite a demon. I've never invited a demon, nor will I ever invite a demon. In fact, I reject demons. I renounce demons in Jesus' name all the time. And so when somebody tells me, you know what, I've put a curse on you. A neighbor's put a curse on you because you preach the gospel, you're on radio. I laugh. I said, knock yourself out, dude. I said, I got Jesus. I got a Jesus bulletproof vest. So when you throw your, your, uh, your weak curses at me, they just bounce off my Jesus bulletproof vest. Third way, people fall prey to the devil. Grave hardening in sin. This is the person's fault. This is the point of entry. Somebody who lives in mortal sin, somebody who lives just a, a life of evil, a wretched life, number one, they're inviting demons by their evil life, and even demons are attracted to evil people. Just like flies are attracted to poop on a hot summer day, demons are attracted to evil people. Just like flies are attracted to, to manure. Exactly. Demons can sense the energy of evil people. And they're attracted to that. A classic example of somebody who brought about demonic contamination was Judas the betrayer, one of the 12 apostles. If you saw the movie The Passion of the Christ, he ended up committing suicide. He was demonically possessed. He was an evil person. He's a classic example of somebody as a result of living in mortal sin with a hardened heart that ended up inviting a demon and he ended up killing himself. By the way, the greatest victory for a demon, the goal of a demon is suicide. That's for them, like, that's like their touchdown. The goal of a demon is to get the human person so desperate, so depressed, so despondent that they would destroy themselves. That's the ultimate victory for Satan and demons is the suicide of the person because a human being is made in the image and likeness of God. There's a lot of people that abandon themselves to grave hardening in sin. You know, for example, people who are involved in sexual perverted lifestyles, unconfessed sin like abortion, uh, living a life of violence, alcoholism, drugs, those are people that fall into this group. Their heart is hardened against God. 
And so when you take all these factors into account, you can understand why the, the, the number of individuals that, that have been stricken by evil ailments has multiplied in our society. Also, why is there a rise in demonic activity in our society? Another reason. Less people are being baptized. Baptism is the first weapon against Satan. Less people are being baptized in the Catholic Church. And so, as, there are less, as baptism decreases, Satanism rises in this country. Fourth way that an evil spirit attacks us. Proximity to evil places or persons. This is the point of entry. This is inviting a demon. And if you hang out in evil places or with evil persons, guess what? And if you have some type of demonic contamination, it's your fault. For example, this would include like attending a seance or dabbling in magic, you know, witchcraft, consulting witches, curanderas, la Santa Muerte cult, witch doctors, card readers, satanic groups out there called satanic covens. This would involve also occult superstitious practices such as participating in a black mass, which is the most evil thing to do on planet Earth. Another way that people also contaminate themselves is by just the bad music that they listen to. Bad music. Some violent horror movies. A lot of violent horror movies. Pornography. Anything that glorifies evil, anything that perverts the human person, that, per, that perverts purity, perverts love, any of those things, you open yourself to demonic contamination. There's a verse in the Bible in Psalm 84, verse 11. It says, Better the threshold of the house of my God than a home in the tents of the wicked. In other words, it's a lot better to hang out with God than to hang out with wicked people. So next, what's the dangerous influence of certain music? There's a European magazine in 1982 that had an article on the dangers of certain music. And the article said that you can identify records consecrated to Satan based on four principles. Number one, the beat. Number two, volume intensity. Number three, subliminal signal. Number four, ritual consecration of records to Satan through a black mass. There's another Bible verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 5. The Bible says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. If, if you ever really want to know the category of evil music, it's simple. There's so much evil music today. If you listen to the words of some of the songs, you'll realize that evil music generally has a subject, and it's always the same. Rebel against your parents. Rebel against society. Rebel against the system. Rebel against authority. Uh, unleash all sexual instincts. And uh, this, this, this call to anarchy in society. All the bad music, they have the same common theme. And you'll find some musicians, some musicians openly, they dedicate their songs to Satan. The list is so long, I don't even want to bore you with the list, but I have a list of musicians that ritually dedicate their songs to Satan, and the list is too long to go through right now. Next, our Lord Jesus Christ, he tells us that the devil is the prince of this world. Jesus tells us that in John chapter 12, verse 31. He tells us in John chapter 14, verse 30. And he tells us in John chapter 16, verse 11. He calls Satan the prince of this world. What does he mean by that? He means that the vast majority of this world follows Satan. That's a fact. That's a fact. The vast majority of this world doesn't follow Jesus, who represents goodness, beauty, and truth. You know why? Because that's difficult. It's hard to do the right thing, to be good, to be virtuous. 
Most people just follow their disordered passions and follow their animal instincts, their base desires. And by doing so, they follow Satan. Also, St. Paul, he calls Satan the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. St. Paul calls Satan the God, lowercase g, which means he's a false god. Okay, how can we resist the devil? Let's get into some deeper waters here. How can we resist the devil? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, he says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Those are military words. Watch, that's a military word. You gotta be alert where you go, who you hang out with, what music you listen to, what books you read, what parties you go to. You have to be alert. You have to be vigilant. There are evil people out there, real evil people. And misery loves company. So what are the, the extraordinary ways that demons attack us. Number one, demonic possession. This occurs when Satan takes full possession of the body, but not the soul. And the demon speaks and acts without the knowledge or consent of the victim. So the victim is, is morally blameless in possession. And some of the signs of possession, there's actually four signs that the church identifies of a possessed person. Number one, a possessed person can speak foreign languages or, or languages that they never studied, obviously. A possessed person has extraordinary strength. A possessed person also reveals the unknown. They know certain things, hidden information that they shouldn't know. They walk in a room and say, hey, you know, yeah, you know, goody two-shoes. Didn't you, you know, rob a bank 10 years ago and nobody knows about it and you still got $50,000 over there in, a, in the Bahamas somewhere? Possessed people have hidden knowledge. And also possessed people, they can be in the presence of holy objects. So if, there, if a possessed person would come into the church, they would start, they'd go, they start blaspheming, they start cussing, they start insulting. They're horrified by sacred objects. They're horrified by religious objects. Also, a possessed person, they have a second personality. And that second personality has an evil character. And once the priest prays over a possessed person, you'll see, you'll see the manifestation start where the person's hands will start twitching, their, their face will tense up. Their eyes will roll back. You'll see only the whites of their eyes. They'll speak or they'll scream in a, with an evil voice that's not theirs. You can hear an evil laugh come out, and you know it's not their laugh. Sometimes a possessed person, you'll see they'll hiss like a cat, or they'll bark like a dog, or they'll snort like a pig. They'll make animal noises. Second, second way that people are attacked is called diabolical oppression. This is a lot more common. Diabolical oppression is random physical discomfort such as being scratched by an invisible hand or even external physical pain that can be caused by a demon. And the symptoms and the gravity differ greatly case by case. Demonic oppression, it can also strike, for example, somebody's health. It can affect their job. It can affect their relationships with others. And in demonic oppression, sometimes the symptoms, they're unexplainable. There's like an unexplainable anger or rage in the person. And sometimes a person just has a tendency to complete isolation. They don't want to be around people. And the Bible gives us many examples of oppression, even to saints. One of them was Job. Job chapter 1. Read it when you get home. He was diabolically, demonically oppressed. He was not possessed. He was oppressed. When you, re when you read the, the, uh, Job's story, he lost his children he lost his property, his goods, his cattle. He lost his health. He lost everything. He was being oppressed by a demon. We also know that St. Paul, the apostle, he also suffered from demonic oppression. 
He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. This is a holy saint, a holy man of God. St. Paul says this, And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I sought the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The word of the Lord. So what was going on there? St. Paul, God took him to heaven. He was allowed to see heaven. He brings him back to earth, and St. Paul, just so he didn't start boasting like, ha, 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 yeah, what'd you do this weekend? Well, I went to my mom this weekend. Well, I went to heaven this weekend. God didn't want St. Paul to start boasting and bragging, so the Lord allowed Satan to oppress him, to attack him. And St. Paul says, a messenger of Satan put a thorn in my side. We're not really sure what that meant. There's debates as to what specifically it meant. But we do know that he had a physical ailment that a demon put on him with God's permission. And he said, God, take this away, please. Come on, I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm a preacher, a theologian, an apostle. I'm an evangelist. Take this away. God said, nope, mm -mm. I'm not taking it away from you because I don't want you to start bragging about you saw heaven. I want you to know that my grace is sufficient. I'm going to carry you through this pain so you don't forget who you are and who I am. So you don't boast. I'm going to allow you to suffer because I've given you this great vision of the afterlife, the next life. Also, in, the, in Catholic tradition, there's many saints that have suffered from demonic oppression. St. Saint, Saint Paul of the Cross, St. John Vianney, the cure of ours, St. Padre Pio. These were very holy priests who were beaten, flogged, and pummeled by demons in their, in their rooms, in the monasteries. So diabolical oppression, although it can be physical, it does not affect the soul. Here's something very important, just so you know. The devil can never possess the soul. Never, never. The soul is sacred. The soul is a sanctuary of the human person. The soul is where the person has communion with God. The worst the devil could do or a demon is possess the body entirely. And that's what they can do. They can possess a body entirely, but never the soul. The only place where the soul will be entirely possessed is in hell. Those in hell are fully possessed. Fully. Those on earth, even in full possession, only the bodies possessed, never the soul. Third way the devil attacks us. Third extraordinary way demons attack us. Diabolical obsession. What's this? It's mental discomfort. The symptoms include sudden attacks at times of ongoing, of obsessive thoughts like, oh, pornography, I gotta I got I got get my fix of pornography, or violence, or, or you know, I gotta cut somebody else's head off today, or, or lust, you know, or hate, or anger, or blasphemy against what is holy. So when somebody obsesses about things that are evil, it can be diabolical obsession. A demon can cause that. And sometimes in diabolical obsession, the discomfort is so acute that the victim is unable to free themselves of this obsession. Therefore, the obsessed person lives in a perpetual state of desperation, prostration, and attempts at suicide. Obsession almost always influences your dreams. For example, nightmares, which everybody has had, that's a case of diabolical obsession. Because when we're asleep, we're very vulnerable. See, during the daytime, you're alert, you're guarded, you guard your thoughts, you guard your mind, you watch, you take custody of your eyes and your senses. But when you're asleep, you're unguarded. And so a person that lives in a state of mortal sin doesn't have a prayer life, doesn't have a very weak faith life. They're very susceptible to demonic attacks when they're asleep because you're unguarded and you have no faith life. And so they attack us through our dreams, nightmares. And as I told you before, the goal, the goal of 
Satan and his demons, the goal was to have the human person commit suicide. That's the goal. And temptation to suicide, it occurs in, in all, three, all these three that I just mentioned. It occurs in, in demonic possession, diabolical oppression, and diabolical obsession. All of them. There's always this tendency towards suicide. Diabolical obsession is also it's a mental discomfort by a demon and oppression, the difference, it's a physical discomfort by a demon. So obsession is a mental discomfort. Obsession is a physical discomfort. And possession is a full assault. It's a full assault on your body. Number four, diabolical infestation. This is the phenomenon in which a demon possesses a place such as a house or building or an object. And right now, there's so many reality shows about this. And this is, these things the church has said for 2,000 years that it is a fact that demons can possess a place. We call them today haunted houses. A demon, by possessing a place, can move things at will, and a demon can cause various noises and smells. Diabolical infestation can occur in a particular place due to some like occultic activity or satanic activity that was performed there. And diabolical infestation of a place may result from a hex, a spell, curses, witchcraft, voodoo, or maybe somebody was killed in the house. Somebody committed suicide. Maybe it was a whorehouse, it's a brothel, or it's a street gang house, or it's an outlaw biker clubhouse where they have orgies there and they have uh, you know, al alcoholic binges and, and uh, weekends of intoxication with all kinds of narcotics. Or it could have been a former crack house or a meth lab. Those places are infested with demons. Places where sin and evil occurs invite demons. The fifth way that we are attacked, the extraordinary attack of the devil, is called diabolical subjugation. And this term indicates a voluntary pact explicitly or implicitly with the devil by which a person submits to, uh, entirely to a demon. For example, I'll give you a case that happened here in, in, in Southern California. Most of you weren't even born yet. But there was a serial killer here in Southern California. He was called Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And uh, I know it was my friends that arrested him over in East Los Angeles Station. I know the guys that arrested him. I work with them. And I know the detective who prosecuted him, Detective Gil Carrillo. He's retired now. And Richard Ramirez, a serial killer, he was very open with the investigators, we, we arrested him for 27 murders, 27 murders of women, and we convicted him, the LA Sheriff's Department, we convicted him of 14 murders. So 13 murders we weren't able to convict him of, but he admitted to later. And he actually told the detectives, he says, I killed way more people than you guys arrested me for. So he admitted it. And uh, once he was convicted and prosecuted and on his way to death row, he would, op he would openly talk about his case. And people asked him, so why did you do it? And he says, I did it because the devil told me to. In court, he would paint this, this satanic symbol on his hands, a pentagram. It's a circle with a five-pointed star with a marker. And when the cameras would come into court, he'd go like this. He'd walk around like this. So he was very open. He had made a, a blood pact with the devil, or what's called diabolical subjugation, where somebody makes a pact with the devil. Okay. How do we protect, protect ourselves from Satan? Because I know this is more important. This is what you guys want to know. <laughs> Who wants to know how to protect themselves from the devil? Huh? Raise your hand. Good. All right. How to protect ourselves from the devil. Number one, the sacrament of baptism is the first act of liberation from the power of Satan. Through the sacrament, we are grafted into Jesus Christ. That is why baptism includes a rite of exorcism. That's in the Catechism, paragraph 1673. What does that mean? At whatever age you were baptized, it doesn't matter what age you were baptized, I don't know if you realize, but I'm telling you now, you were exercised. Everybody who was baptized, I got baptized at three months, so I've been baptized you know, for 53 years. An exorcism was, was done upon me when I was a three-month-old baby. That's what baptism is. Baptism is a minor exorcism. And that's the first level of protection that the church gives us against the devil. Number two, Jesus says that some demons 
can only be driven out by faith. So you have to have faith to drive out a demon. You have to have faith, Matthew 17, 20. And the Dewey Reams Bible, which is uh, the old Catholic Bible, uh, the, actually the official Catholic Bible, it says that some demons can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. So what is it required to be free of demons? Three things. A life of faith in Jesus, a life of prayer, and a life of fasting. Okay? Fasting is a sign of discipline and penance, which shows our fidelity to God. And uh, fasting makes us stronger because on Fridays during Lent, and even Fridays throughout the year, the church says that every single Friday, every Catholic is supposed to offer some type of penance. So it would be a good idea for you to fast on Friday. What's a church fast? A church fast is this. It's not that hard. It's one complete meal and two smaller meals that don't even equal one full meal. No snacks in between. That's called an ecclesiastical fast. And the church recommends that you do that every Friday. In fact, it's part of canon law. Why? You know, if you're kind of hungry on Friday throughout the day, you start realizing, you know, like as your stomach is talking to you and you're hungry and stuff like, man, that In-N-Out burger sure looks good, but, you know, the Lord wants me to fat because, fast because this is going to purify me. Fasting makes us realize how weak and mortal we really are and how much we need God, how much we depend on God. That's what fasting reminds us of how mortal and how weak we truly are and how much we rely on God even for our next breath. Point number three, how to protect ourselves from Satan. Demons are afraid of the name of Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself, he said that his disciples would use his name to drive out demons. It's right in the Bible. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20. You can read it when you get home. And Jesus Christ says in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus said, in my name they will cast out demons. The word of the Lord. We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. So when we use the holy name of Jesus in prayer, it's just like an, an actual ambassador, the way he acts when he represents uh, the president or a government in front of another country. He has his authority. So when we act as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we have Jesus' authority to do what he said. He said, you'll cast out demons in my name. In most cases, lay people, us as Catholic Christians, we can fight evil and an evil spirit simply by invoking the name of Jesus in prayer. I tell people, if you're having a nightmare, wake up and start saying, Jesus, Jesus, Mary, Jesus, Hail Mary, the Our Father, the Jesus, I trust in you, it'll go away. Demons can be in the presence when you start saying those, the name of Jesus and his mother Mary. They'll leave. Everybody I've told, when you have a nightmare or bad thoughts, start saying the Hail Mary, start saying the name of Jesus, Jesus, I trust in you, our Father, it'll go away immediately. Gone. And, and really, our best and our easiest remedy against evil is the name of Jesus. It, it, uh, it, drives, it drives any demon, any demon will flee us or flee from our side if uh, we just say the name of Jesus with faith, hope, and love. The name of Jesus, really, it's, it's the shortest prayer, and it's the most perfect prayer. I'm going to teach you something right now, and uh, I think it'll help you. It's called a prayer of rebuke, okay? I'm going to do a little, a little dynamic with you. A prayer of rebuke is like when you get a bad thought, and a lot of bad thoughts are put there by an evil spirit, okay? When you get a bad thought, a bad word, an obscene thought, you're called to go into battle mode and you're called to do a prayer of rebuke immediately. Who taught us the prayer of rebuke? Jesus did. It's in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. The devil started tempting Jesus and Jesus simply said, Be gone, Satan! That's called a prayer of rebuke. So, okay, I'm going to set up a scenario. Here you are. I'm a young person. I'm 17 years old, okay? I know I don't look it, but I'm 17, all right? And I'm going to school, and, and uh, some guys go, hey, hey, Jess, man, uh, at nutrition, uh, you know, let's go, let's go smoke some. 
or whatever you guys call it these days. Okay, I'm, let's go smoke. So you're saying, mm, man, peer pressure. I want the guys to you know think I'm cool and stuff, and I want to be accepted. But you know, I don't know. I don't know if they're gonna have that dope and stuff. You know, I don't. I don't want to smoke that whack. I know that got that THC so high. I don't want to do that. You know what you say is you start to think in the mind, should I go? Oh man, I want to prayer rebuke. You say this, watch. Evil spirit of marijuana in Jesus' name, be gone. That's called a prayer rebuke. Immediately, you take your thoughts captive to Jesus Christ. In your mind, you're saying, oh man, I, I should go with the guys and go smoke out. Say, no. Evil spirit of marijuana in Jesus' name, be gone. That's a prayer rebuke. Somebody says, hey, dude. Come over here to this classroom. The teachers are gone. I got some pornographic websites. Oh, dude, you, you can't believe what I got. I'll see you in 15 minutes. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm weak. Lord, help me. And say it. Evil spirit of pornography in Jesus' name. Be gone. That's called the prayer of rebuke. That's called taking control of your mind. Taking control of your thoughts. You have to verbalize it. You have to say it with conviction. Most Catholics walk around, they're being tempted, they're like, eh, and they just wither like a leaf. They just melt like Frosty the Snowman. You gotta fight back, this is war. The devil wants your soul. You're tempted, you say, you know what, I know that's a demonic, that, that's a demonic temptation. Evil spirit of Gentlemen's clubs, leave me. Be gone in Jesus' name. Leave me. Now. If you would take a picture of me, or, or if a camera would follow me like all day, you guys would say, Jess Romero's crazy. <laughs> you know why? Because I do prayers of rebuke probably about five or six times a day. Because I know that demons exist. I know they attack and they, 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 they first attack the thoughts. It's called demonic thought tampering. And so what I do, because temptation starts with a thought, then it goes to the imagination. Then it runs to the passions, to the members of the body, then you fall into sin. So when I get those bad thoughts, immediately I rebuke them in Jesus' name. They're loud on the spot. My kids say, Dad, you're talking to yourself again. I said, no, I'm not. I'm talking to Jesus. Okay, Dad. It's called the prayer of rebuke. Okay? It's basically this. A prayer rebuke is you get that bad thought and you say whatever it is, you identify that bad thought. Don't be afraid. Identify it. Evil spirit of whatever it is, be gone in Jesus' name. Leave me in Jesus' name. That's a prayer of rebuke that's found in the Catholic Bible, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Who taught us that? A pope? No, Jesus. Let's move on. Point number four. What's the devil afraid of? The Holy Eucharist. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, here's what the Bible says. It says, quote, and they, that means us, God's people, and they have conquered him. The pronoun him is the devil when you read Revelation 12. By the blood of the lamb. Ah, the blood of the lamb. That's Jesus Christ. Where do you get the blood of the lamb? Holy communion. Look what the Bible says. And they, that's us, the people of God, have conquered him, that's the devil, pronoun the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. How do we conquer the devil? Two ways. Receiving Holy Communion, obviously in a state of grace. And number two, the word of your testimony. What does that mean? Speaking the truth. The devil fears people that speak the truth. The devil loves liars. Because the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 44, the devil is the father of lies. 
The devil loves liars. The devil cannot stand or be in the presence of one who speaks the truth. Point number five, <clears throat> how to protect ourselves from Satan. Our Lady protects us from Satan. I'm going to show you in the Bible, and I'm going to break it down for you, okay? Because I'm a Bible study teacher, so I take the difficult passages of Scripture and make them understandable for people, for lay Catholics, okay? Here's the passage in the Bible, the first book of the Bible, third chapter, Genesis 3, 14 and 15. This is what the Catholic Church calls the first gospel, the proto-evangelium, the first announcement of Jesus. I'm going to break it down to you. I'm going to read what the Bible says. What's in brackets, I'm interpreting it for you, okay? I did all the hard work for you, okay? I'm gonna, so you could understand what it means, I broke it down for you. Okay, so what's in brackets is my insertion into the text, which is what the church teaches. Okay, here it is. Let's read the Bible and let's look at the brackets. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Now, the only persons in the world at this point are God, Adam, and Eve. There's nobody else. Nobody else exists yet. Adam and Eve haven't, haven't even had their first kids yet. You know, Abel, Cain, Seth, and, 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 and others. There's, they're still childless, no kids yet. It's only Adam and Eve and God in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve have disobeyed God, and so God now is going to discipline them. And here's what God is going to, here's what God tells them by way of discipline, and then God is also going to punish or curse the devil. Let's look at the conversation between God and uh, Adam, Eve, and he directs also the curse to Satan. It says, the Lord God said to the serpent, who's the serpent? Okay. Because you, who's you? Have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I, who's I? God. Will put enmity. What does enmity mean? Between you, who's you? And the woman, who's the woman? And between your seed, who's the devil's seed? And her seed, who's Mary's seed? He, the pronoun, who's that? Shall bruise your head, whose head? And you, who's you? Shall bruise his, who's his? Heel. There we have a, a prophecy by God the Father who tells Satan, who's taken the form of a serpent, that because he's deceived God's firstborn son, Adam, and his firstborn daughter, Eve, he's deceived them and led them into sin and rebellion. God is now going to deal with Adam and Eve, his son and daughter, but he's also going to deal with Satan. And he pr promises Satan that in the future, this woman, who's not born yet, she won't be born for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, this special woman who's going to be the new Eve, Mary, is going to give birth to the new Adam, Jesus. And this new Eve, and this new, and new Adam, Jesus and Mary, will undo the knot of disobedience that Adam and Eve tied the human race to. Adam and Eve tied the human race into a knot of disobedience. The new Adam and the new Eve, Jesus and Mary, will come in the future and untie the knot of disobedience between the human race and Satan. And notice what it says in the text. It says that the devil has offspring. The devil has children. He sure does. Who are the devil's children? Evil people. Evil people. 
and people that deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they don't do it out of invincible ignorance. They do it out of evil and malicious design. And notice the last sentence where it says, and you devil shall bruise his Jesus heel. How does the devil bruise Jesus heel? How does he do that? You know how? When he goes after one of us. We are Jesus' children. We are the body of Christ. When one of us falls into sin, that's how the devil strikes at the heel of Jesus by going after one of us and taking us out. There will be conflict between the devil and the woman. The devil will make war against the woman and her seed, which is Jesus, but her seed will have victory. He, Jesus, will crush the devil's head. Let's pray. Uh, I put there a powerful deliverance prayer against evil spirits that exorcists actually use over a possessed person. So we'll pray this prayer, then we'll continue. It's, uh, let's pray it all together. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This is a, an, an exorcism prayer calling upon the intercession of Mary that's used by priests. Let's pray together. August Queen of Heaven, Sovereign Mistress of the Angels, Thou who from the beginning has received from God the power and the mission to crush the head of Satan, we humbly beseech Thee to send Thy holy legions, that under Thy command and by Thy power they may pursue the evil spirits, encounter them on every side, resist their bold attacks, and drive them hence into the abyss of eternal hell. Amen. What else is the devil afraid of? Holy water. Catholics should have holy water in their house. Holy water can torment or expel demons because the church has given a spiritual power to this object by blessing it. And the church has received the power from Jesus Christ to place a blessing upon a particular object. Holy water is effective because it symbolizes purity and cleanliness. In fact, in the Old Testament, Jews also used to use holy water. You see in the book of Numbers, chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, In an earthen vessel, he, the priest, shall take holy water. What else protects us against the devil? Point number seven, our baptismal promises. Renewing our baptismal promises is always extremely useful. We do it once a year in the Catholic Church. We confirm our faith in God, our commitment to Him, and we reject Satan and all that comes from him. In fact, the entire Bible is an invitation to break the bond with idols, which are really demons. That's what an idol is. If you're not worshiping God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if, if God is not the center of your life, then you've made for yourself an idol. There's something else that's taken up your time, your talent, and your treasure. And any idol, anything that takes your eyes and your heart away from God is a demon. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19 and 21. And the whole Bible is an invitation to turn decisively to God. Point number eight, how to pr uh, protect ourselves against evil spirits. Confession, the sacrament of confession. This is the best exorcism because confession is the, is the most direct means to fight Satan. Because it is a sacrament that tears souls from the demon's grasp. It strengthens us against sin. It unites us more closely to God. And it helps to confirm our souls to the divine will. The Catholic Church recommends that we go to confession at least once a year, minimum. That's what the church says. At least once a year in paragraph 1457. The saints of the Catholic Church, like Blessed Mother Teresa, Teresa St. Pope John Paul II, St. Padre Pio, St. Faustina, the saints recommend that we go to confession once a month. Once a month. Why is confession more powerful than an exorcism? I'll tell you why. Because in an exorcism, the demon possesses the body. So in an exorcism, the prayers are supposed to 
to expel the demon from the body. But in confession, the sacrament of confession, that sanctifying grace that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ, that takes out evil, not from our body, from our soul. The sacrament of confession removes evil from the soul. That's why demons fear confession. Father Gabriel Amorth, who's the chief exorcist of the Vatican, he's been the top exorcist of the Catholic Church for 32 years, appointed by St. Pope John Paul II. He writes that in one of the exorcisms that he was doing, he said, the demon said, he said, we fear confession more than anything else. Why? Because confession, it flushes evil from the soul. It's more powerful than an exorcism. Point number nine. We're almost done. In your Bible, there's two Bible verses that are very powerful against evil spirits. Psalm 68, verses 1 and 2, and Psalm 91. They're the two most powerful psalms that Catholics can pray against the devil for spiritual warfare and for a spiritual canopy of protection. Psalm 68, verses 1 and 2 is one of the official exorcism prayers of the Catholic Church, and Psalm 91 was quoted by our Lord Jesus Christ against the devil when he was tempted in the desert. I remember a while back ago, there was this one lady who said, I have, you know, I've been going to a witch and some curandera, and I'm having nightmares, and and uh, voices come out of my mouth that I don't, I don't know where they come from and stuff. And, and uh, she went to a retreat that I was giving, and uh, I started giving this talk, and she started shaking. There's like, you know, a couple hundred people there, and she's really shaking. And she starts fainting, and she starts like dry vomiting in the air. So we kind of pulled her aside, and, and I went to go talk to her. And she says, everything you're saying is true. It's all happening to me. She says, and when you start talking about holy stuff, I can't... I start feeling like I, I, I want to vomit when you hold up your crucifix and stuff. And so what I said, okay, I'm going to see how bad this woman is. I said, okay. I said, sit down here, relax. I took my Bible and I put it. I said, open your hands like this. I put it in her hands and she started shaking. I mean, she, she was a young little girl too. She started shaking. And then I said, read Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is an exorcism psalm. I started, read Psalm 91. She goes, I can't, I'm going to throw up, I can't, get it out of me. And he was like, it's burning, it's burning, get it out of me. And I took the Bible away and, you know, we dealt with her after. But uh, this stuff is happening to Latino Catholics all over because they're doing stuff that they're not supposed to be doing. And a lot of Latino Catholics just don't go to Mass, don't pray anymore. We live like pagans and we end up, we have some type of question, we end up going to some curandera, some witch, go to the horoscopes. Those are all invitations of evil spirits to come into your body. That's a direct invitation of an evil spirit. Point number 10, and we're done. Two things the devil fears above all. The fire of charity, which means a heart full of love. That's what it means, a fire of charity. The devil fears somebody who's got a heart full of love and the well-trodden path of humility. The devil fears humility. That's why the devil doesn't fear any politician and the devil doesn't fear any lawyer. That's my comment. It's not the, okay. That was my personal opinion. Okay, I'm going to teach you two powerful prayers against evil spirits. You should be praying them every day, morning and evening. And by the way, I, I, on my business cards, I brought a lot of them. I got two exorcism prayers in my business cards, so just go, get, go to my table and grab one for free. Okay, put in your wallet. And throughout the day, you should be praying in the morning, praying in the evening, or during some situation like, oh no, where's this card at? Take it out and start praying it. I got two prayers in the back of my business card. They're deliverance prayers, okay? Let's pray. We'll end with this. This prayer here called the soul of Christ, this should be prayed every day, but especially after you receive Holy Communion. It's a powerful deliverance prayer against evil spirits. Let's pray it together. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Separated from you, let me never be. From the evil one, protect me. At the hour of my death, call me. And close to you, keep me, that with your saints and angels, I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. Here's the way I end my prayers at the start and at the end of every day. 
And this was taught to me by an exorcist priest. And so you can repeat after me all together. I cover myself with the precious blood of Jesus, the blood that was shed for me on Calvary, the blood that feeds my soul in the Holy Eucharist, the blood that sanctifies me, and the blood that makes hell tremble. I claim the power and protection of the precious blood of Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all you young people, I brought you a free little booklet. Go to my table. There's a booklet called Let There Be Light. It's a little booklet to remind you about the importance of following Jesus Christ as a young Catholic. Also, go pick up my business card. And for you viejos like me, if you want to, uh, I got this talk recorded. Okay? This talk's recorded. This talk is called Spiritual Warfare. Put on the Catholic armor of God. I brought a lot of my spiritual warfare talks. Here's another one I have. It's called Fighting Our Demons, Overcoming Our Addictions. A lot of our addictions are demonic in nature. I give you seven ways of how to break addictions. Here's another one. It's called Hell Described. This is the testimony of saints who have actually seen hell, like St. Catherine of Genoa, St. Faustina, and others, and they give you a description of hell. Here's another one. It's called The Three Enemies of the Soul, where I go in detail of the way the devil attacks the soul, the way the world attacks the soul, and the way our, the disordered appetites of the flesh attack the soul, and how we can combat it. This is a CD, it's called Deliverous Prayers in Action. This one here, I actually pray for an hour deliverance prayers against evil spirits, so you can hear them. I mean, if you know somebody like, somebody in your house that's, that's you know, your, your uncle that hasn't been to church in 40 years, and he slams heroin and uses coke every day and he was for, in prison for 20 years and he, he sits all day watching pornography and scratching his belly, put this CD on him, okay? Hey, hey, hey uncle, I want to listen to this. These are deliverance prayers. I pray them for an hour and I'm telling you, people uh, have told me, said, I listened to this, I started going to mass. I felt something come upon me. I felt the Spirit, Holy Spirit come. I felt an evil spirit leave. Here's also another talk, it's called 10 Ways to Protect Yourself Against the Devil, where I go into detail on the last part of this talk. And, uh, and also here's a, set, a CD set that I did, it's called Christianity versus the Occult. I talk about 13 ways, the way the devil comes at, at us. Some of the more contemporary ways, Freemasonry, I talk about the demonic uh, roots of Freemasonry, Wicca, Kabbalah, the Church of Saint, when it started, what they teach, Santeria, Voodoo, Spiritualism, uh, astrology, horoscopes. These are ways that the devil is coming into the lives of Catholics, so I give you the details. Other than that, brothers and sisters in Christ, you've been good students. God bless you. God, God love you. Keep the faith. We'll see you next month.